Pull it up. Okay. All right. I found it. Let me do a little share screen here. Okay. So there it is. Uh, um, I'd say it's a little sloppy. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't. So why don't you walk us through it? Kyle, you can mute and walk us through it. Or maybe you thought you unmuted. But Oops, you yeah, I thought I was talking i was actually talking but whatever all right so uh yeah for the suggested answer it said it was a steeper isoquant for the stone so i kind of just made it like a steeper uh part of a curve and then steel would be further out uh, i worked on this with uh jess and Liv, so i wasn't entirely sure how to get this one i was kind of lost but okay. yeah that's what i had for that one so um yeah, the reason I just wanted to stop with this one is I didn't want you guys to go too far, but I did want you to kind of uh, look at it a little more. Did anybody do anything more with your dollar business? It's just draw two curves kind of similar to the way Kyle did it. Um, I've got um, a little bit different. Just, okay. I just added values, but it's kind of the same. Did it even have values though? That's I think that's why. I did. Yeah, well, the, you had the hundred dollar thing. Yeah. So that's what I was kind of wondering. Did you did something with that, uh, JC? Yeah, kind of. I think it's wrong though, but it's something different. Okay. Let's see. Uh, get things in the way for me here. <coughs> got this thing blown up too big now. All right, that, GC, let's take a peek at yours and then I'll attempt to show you guys a little picture of what I drew. Oh, those are pretty there. It's in the other one, chap 11.1. .1. Oh, okay, we got a JPEG on it, got it. Okay. Um, mm. So you've got the lot size at one and a hundred. So they said um, initial price regarding the, the material, it's 101 at the start for normal lot size. Uh, yeah, I'm with you there, but for what size was that? It was for 5,000 square foot. So I think you should start your graph over to the larger size over here. So if I was to, uh, in fact, I'll just draw this for you guys on JC's. So I'll attempt to anyway, we'll see how this works. So 5,000 was over here, right? Yeah. So there's 5,000, that's where they actually started. So the isoquants I drew were like this. And because which one's more expensive? Steel. The stone or the steel? Steel. You got smaller. Which one's on top here? Is that the stone or the steel? In other words, which one's more cost effective even as you get smaller in size? It's it kind of this problem kind of pushes you to work your mind backwards. So you're working on a smaller lot. Which one's easier to support in the air? A thousand pounds of stone, a thousand feet in the air, or a thousand or uh, the equivalent amount of steel? Steel. Yeah, the steel. So the, the one on top here is actually the stone. The stone is more costly and the steel is less. And so they start off at a hundred is right here. So that's kind of the picture that I drew for that. 
Uh, you know, I just wanted you guys to kind of think through the idea of an isoquant. So let me let me just pause a little bit to review that with you again. So along a single isoquant, the quantity is uh, fixed. And that's what iso means same, quant is quantity. And so here we're measuring uh, the amount of capital used um, versus the lot size. And so those are our two resources on the horizontal axis being lot size and then capital being on the vertical axis. And so along a single isoquant, we have the same amount there. And so all this is saying is that when we shrink the lot size, it's going to become uh, more and more capital intensive to support stone as it is to support steel. So that's, that's the correct answer. And then I, I, probably, I won't even spend some time going on to why I deleted number two, because that gets into the ISO cost and how that's cost minimizing, which is something those of you who had intermediate, um, in fact, I'll say that just, just because um, the, uh, decent amount of you have had intermediate. If I draw the ISO cost lines, let me put those in red. So remember the ISO cost lines are the straight lines. It'll be cheaper to have steel than it will be to have that. The ISO cost lines is the price of capital. So the rental rate and the uh, price of the lot. So the market tells us the prices of those resources, and then that sets up the ISO cost line. So that's why I deleted that one that I didn't want to get too involved with ISO costs and ISO quants, but I did want you to, since we covered it in class, the, the idea of the ISO quant. So let me pause there for 10 seconds if you want to unmute and ask any questions, otherwise we'll move on. Uh, sorry, you asked, how did you define ISO quants? Isoquant is the, um, let me, let me try to get to a clean page here. So clear. Um, give me a second, I'll still use JC's paper here, but let me attempt to do this. So an isoquant shows the, and let me just, let me go back to the general thing rather than getting wrapped up with lot size. So normally we have machines, capital, and labor, people. And it says to make a uh, hundred bottles of beer, I could make a hundred bottles of beer with a lot of people and a little bit of machines, maybe my little craft brewery, or I could make beer with big machines, Budweiser, and a little bit of people. So I can produce beer along this isoquant, a hundred bottles of beer with 10 units of labor, or let's call it 11 since I did 11, and, or two units of labor and six machines, or 11 units of labor and two machines. So it's the various combinations of physical inputs that I can use to make the same quantity. Does that answer your question? I'm guessing you're muted. Yeah, it's my, my uh, just died. My, uh, okay. Just fell through, but yeah, thank you. Okay, good. Anything else on that? I didn't see who was talking at the time because I had the people's heads uh, hidden. Okay, any other questions on the homework? All righty, so let's, uh, this next chapter um, is kind of a reading comprehension chapter again. So we're going to look at, uh, oh, the other important part, we are skipping all of chapter 12. So all of chapter 12, there's parts of it we could have done, but I decided it wasn't worth it to just do parts of the chapter because it really gets into uh, utility and some other things. Again, we're 
intermediate concepts that some of you have had, but not all of you. So no big deal, we're gonna skip, and, and the concepts aren't, they're, they're kind of similar to what we did before, but the author chose to take that approach. So we're going to skip chapter 12, and we're moving into chapter 13, which is a little bit more of a reading comprehension type of chapter. So that's what we're gonna work on today. And here we go. Okay, so the chapter works on spatial distribution. So spatial distribution of employment and residence. So what are some ways to represent the spatial distribution of employment and residents within a metropolitan area. So first of all, what do we mean by spatial distribution? Uh, Daniel, it looks like you're first on my hit list here. So what, is, what do you think they mean by spatial distribution? You can unmute. And you're still muted. So don't Google this. This is just off the top of your head. You don't have to have the right answer. This is just, this is just conversation. So you guys don't sweat it. Don't sit there and Google like, what's spatial distribution? I have no clue. I will nurse you along. It's not meant to be anything uh, too big a deal like you get a bunch of demerits if you don't get it right. So what do you think they mean by spatial distribution? Daniel, Put it in the chat. Daniel, yeah, you type in chat. This is, uh, well, the question. Well, time out. This is for this is for Daniel. Daniel's mic doesn't work. You put it. In oh, the Daniel's back. mic doesn't work. Got it. Sorry, Daniel. I forgot about your little mic problem. Okay, so that's why you put in the chat group here. I saw somebody chatted, but I didn't know it was you. <laughs> okay. All right. So clustering of firms. Um, no, not so much. I mean, that could be a part of it, but it's a little bit more broad than that. So. Liz, um, what did you have? You were next on my list anyway. Honestly, I have no idea. Okay, so let me, since you've got the audio, just let me kind of work you through it. So um, what do we mean by um, the distribution of the coronavirus in Nevada? What would that mean to you about the distribution of the coronavirus if, uh, in the state of Nevada. You're in Nevada, right? You're in Las Vegas? Yeah, correct. So what would that mean to you if, if you heard on the news, here's the distribution of the coronavirus in Nevada, what would that mean to you? Uh, rise in unemployment. Um, what about specifically to the virus? Now, we're gonna show you a graph or a chart, um, um, illustration of the whole state of Nevada. Here's, the, here's a physical ge geography of Nevada. And here's the distribution of the coronavirus currently in Nevada. What would we be looking at, do you think, if, if they were showing the distribution of the virus over the state of Nevada? Uh, a spread of the virus across uh, the many urban areas? Yeah, yeah, so the Nevada would be broken into counties like every state in the nation, right? And so if we showed a graph of it, or not a graph, but a, uh, an actual map, we could show all the counties of Nevada and show that there's five cases in the northeast corner, there's one case in the middle, and there's 20 cases down in the southeast corner, right? So you're looking at the distribution of the coronavirus over the whole state. So now what we're doing with this problem is to say, well, what's the spatial distribution of employment within Nevada, right? So I assume that Reno and Las Vegas are probably the most populated employment centers in Nevada, right? So if we looked at uh, a map and it showed the number of of jobs, that would probably be the highest place where jobs are concentrated. So we're thinking about the distribution across physical space of employment, and then we're also thinking about the distribution of residences across a physical space. 
So that's what we're that's what we mean by this uh, spatial distribution. And so in this chapter, we're going to explore what are some ways to represent the spatial distribution of employment and residents in the metropolitan area. And so the way that we're going to look at it with numbers and tables is to distinguish the central city and the rest of the metropolitan area. So usually within each place, there'll be a concentrated part of the metropolitan area. And so if you think about a central city um, anywhere you want, uh, how would you describe a central city? Just what's the meaning of that? Uh, Nate Hamilton, you're up. A central city. Um, I, I don't know. I guess like you have like the kind of like the outer parts and stuff. Uh, so the central part of the city would be where, like where all the businesses are and stuff like that. And like the outer part of the city would be where all like the housing and stuff is. Okay. Yeah. I think in a general generalized way i mean what i mean what do you think is our central city here in kansas since you grew up in uh pomona and we got ottawa and i mean what what do you think is the central city for the state of kansas um well i know topeka is the capital but i would say probably the central city if we were choosing one would probably be kansas city yeah and we can have multiple depending on how we define the areas topeka might be a central city depending on how we're defining it gen uh, geographically Right. So, but yeah, I think Kansas City. So, you know, what do we see in Kansas City that we don't see in Pomona? That should be an easy one for you to think about. Um, I mean, all kinds of stuff. There's a lot of different businesses and stuff like that. And there's a lot of different people. Um, just a lot more population, a lot more uh, options, I guess. Yeah, a lot more options for entertainment. Uh, the Kansas City Chiefs, the Kansas City Royals, uh, to name a few right the theater all that stuff that we've talked about in the in the central city so um the the central city is usually can be defined as a as a political area um sometimes defend, defined by um uh, physical boundaries so the, the textbook saying a central city is defined as the principal municipality so it's one that we kind of think about um like chicago or san francisco or kansas city and again, it depends on how we're describing things, but that's the idea of the, of the central city. Okay, so um, out of 152 different metropolitan areas, um, we can see how the demographics have morphed over time. So in 1960, we had about 45% of the people that were living in the central city and working in the central city, 45%. So if we think about downtown Kansas City, like we were just talking about, a lot of people lived there and worked there. And uh, in 2000, we're looking at 15%, a pretty dramatic change about the number of people, which is what this chapter talks about, how that's morphed over time. So then these other columns here, people who live in the central city and work in the suburbs, so live in the central city, but work in the suburbs. Notice how that hasn't changed very much from 1960 to 2000. We had about a similar amount of people that did that. Same thing with living in the suburbs and working in the central city, people commuting to the central city, living in the suburbs. So that hasn't changed very much either from 1960 uh, to 2000, a 40 year span. But here we see living in the suburbs, working in the suburbs. So that has changed. We've got a lot of suburban work that has migrated away from the central city. Right? So we've got 62% now compared to 34, where businesses are choosing to locate somewhere in the city uh, next to people who work. And we've gone over our previous models of reasons why that, why that would be. Let me pause there for 10 seconds. Question or comments on that? Isn't that called the suburban sprawl? It is, yeah. So that's part of what the this chapter is about is sprawl. We'll get to the end of it. Yep, that's right. So urban uh, urban sprawl is is part of the general name for it because the city tends to like spread out. Yep. Okay, so um, for the median workplace, 
um, the uh, researchers in this area will look at, let's split into half of the people who are close and half that are away. So that's what, by definition, the median, like when we did the principle of median location, remember we were always just taking the middle position. And so for the largest 25 metropolitan areas in the United States, the median workplace is 22 kilometers from the center. So 22 kilometers. Let's see, how many miles? Do we got any runners? I can't remember who's a runner in here or not, but uh, how much is a 10K? Who knows how long a 10K race is? Too damn long. <laughs> it's like six or seven miles. Yeah, it's six, right? A little over six. So 3.1 is the is a, a 5K, 3.1 miles. So 6.2 miles roughly is is uh, uh, 10K. So we're talking 12 miles. So we're just, um, tw of the 25 largest metropolitan areas, the median workplace is just 12 miles from the center. So we see a pretty concentrated amount of people that way. And then we can also do the same thing for workers in these uh, large metropolitan areas on where they live. So the median home place from the center. What do you think? Is that further or closer? Let's go to the chat box. Everybody put in further or closer from the center. We'll take a little poll. Further or closer um, in terms of people living, and this is from the center basically. We know that the workplace now is 22, but is the home place further or closer from the center, from the city center. All right, and let's see here, survey says. Further, 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 further. Okay, no closers yet. Oh, there's a closer. Brady wants to be the contrarian, All right? Everybody get their vote in here. So Brady, I want it to be different. Okay, well, fair enough. So let's see if you were right. Sometimes this stuff is counterintuitive in economics and this time it's not, it is what we expected. So a little bit further, not a lot further, just another 5K, another three miles. So we're talking 15 miles from the city center uh, versus the 12 miles for the workplace. Okay, so here is those large uh, cities. And so this is all in kilometers again. We just did New York. Um, so this is kind of across the board. Uh, the closest thing for uh, Kansas City, or at least the central here is St. Louis, falls into 21, 26. So Kansas City did not make the list. Um, is anybody's home place in here, Denver? Let's see. Ty oh, that's right. Tyman's not in this class because he already took this class before. He's in Denver. Is anybody with the state that you're in in here or not? I think quite a few of you are still local. Oh, see the chat box alive. We're Dallas, Texas. Okay, so you are yeah, Dallas. San Francisco. And San Fran. Oh, you're near San Fran. Okay. So what city are you in, Eddie? Concord. Okay, so which is near San Fran? Yeah, like 20 minutes away. It's like okay. 10 miles, maybe. Okay. So 1925 uh, for San Francisco and Dallas, where are you for Daniel here? Oh, that's up here. Okay, 25 and 33. So a lot larger uh, job concentration. So jobs, and those are in the thousands. So those are big. So those are big. Uh, employment centers too is what this is highlighting. And so then uh, percent of jobs within five kilometers. Now, if we look at Dallas, we probably expect there to be a difference between Dallas and, and uh, San Fran. So we got 10 is the percent of jobs within five kilometers, just three miles. And in San Francisco, 27% of jobs are within 5K, right? So, Daniel, would you attest that Dallas has a little more sprawl going on? You can, oh yeah, that's right, you can't talk. Gosh, I go to the mute guy every time. Okay, that's right, type away. 
<laughs> yeah, it's really spread out, right? So Dallas is known for its awful congestion because things have really uh, spread out over time. So, okay. Um, so that gives you a little snapshot of that. Like I said, this whole chapter, by the way, there's not going to be problems of, of kind of math type problems at the end. This is, I'm gonna kind of blow through all of this um, today um, for, because it's really more of a reading comprehension type of chapter. So, and I just closed my chat box here, whoops. Really spread out across suburbs. That's about four and a half miles from my hometown, Lubbock. Yeah, okay. Gotcha. Let me just kind of shrink up the chat box. All right, so then these were some smaller uh, mid-sized places. And so I don't know if anybody's got one of these on their list here. Boise, baby. Boise, that's right. So Nate's got Boise. So here, uh, median workplace 10 and 15. So notice that all of these numbers are a little closer, right? And in Boise, you've got 27% of the jobs within five kilometers and 14% of the workers living within, um, in, within that. Time. They all live on the potato farms. Yeah, you got potatoes, you gotta watch the spud. <laughs> I'm just happy to see Iowa State on that, or Iowa City. Yeah, we don't have, we got Des Moines, Des Moines here, but we don't have, uh, we don't have any little old Ains anyway for me. So anyway, that gives us again kind of a snapshot of the type of stuff we're looking at. Notice that the jobs is a lot smaller. So we've got jobs in thousands. So this is in uh, Boise, 276,000 jobs. And San Antonio, uh, those are getting closer to a million jobs. Uh, little old Wichita's down here. So Kansas City is somewhere in the, in the middle, but here, here's Wichita, Kansas at 292,000 jobs. Okay, so here is the densities. So employment density um, looks at the actual land. So Atlanta is known to be pretty spread out. Boston is not, right? So we have number of jobs per hectare. So again, kind of think of acre, but um, which isn't too big. 25 jobs per hectare. 10 jobs per hectare. So when Boston, you are really on top of each other with skyscrapers and other things, Atlanta tends to be really spread out. How many of you with a thumbs up have traveled to Atlanta? Just curious. I see a couple thumbs up there, Luke and Aaron, yeah. So Atlanta's, uh, and there was Olivia. So uh, you can kind of notice when you go to Atlanta how the metropolitan areas, there's just lots more of uh, three and four story buildings. Um, it's not a metropolitan area like New York where you got lots of skyscrapers and stuff. Um, they got some cool ones though, the Atlanta downtown, the Marriott, where I've gone to a couple different conferences. That's a super cool uh, hotel. If you ever get a chance to visit Atlanta downtown, go see the Marriott Marquis in downtown Atlanta. Uh, it's the hotel that was on, it was oh. in that one movie. What was it, Sam? It was in, it was in, I don't remember what movie it was, but it was in a movie where, uh, Hunger Games. Yes, movie. Hunger Games, yep, yep. It was, they were in the elevator of Hunger Games, and I, I yeah. took pictures when I was there, but it, it is a, really a wild uh, thing what they did. Well, they, I'll just explain it to you. It's, a, I don't know how many stories, let's say 50 stories probably, and the, the whole atrium is open and it curves in on itself. So the railings, it just is bizarre. Like you could almost throw up if you weren't good with heights and um, uh, the way the architect did it is, is really amazing. It looks like it's from another, another place, so. Okay, so that's a little density. Um, employment centers, so Los Angeles, Chicago, um, so, we can start to look at how many uh, s separate type of metropolitan areas there are within places. So there's subcenters, and it is uh, going to be driven by traffic and population, 
right? So as we need to house more people, people start to spread out. So what causes California to have pretty much one story and two story homes versus Boston that has 50 story high rise homes, right? You know, what's the evolution of that? We're going to get into future chapters with zoning and, and uh, other things that have driven up housing prices in places like California because people are trying to preserve some sort of culture with the physical proximity they live in. And then they complain about no affordable housing. Well, that's part of the reasons that they have it is that they have this cultural desire to stay with um, more one and two and three story type dwellings. Okay, so give this list a read. So, who can be first on the chat to tell me what a CBD is? Oh, Daniel's quick on the draw. I guess you can't speak, so you're, you've got your fingers ready on the keyboard. All right, nice job, nice job. Central Business District. So, most jobs are dispersed rather than being in that uh, Central Business District. What would it mean for the, the sub-centers to be highly specialized? Like, Give me an example on the chat. Why don't everybody just kind of put up their own interpretation of what would it mean? Give me some examples of highly specialized sub-centers. Like what would they be doing in these areas that they kind of highlight that they'd be highly specialized? So you can just think about your city or town where some area outside of the downtown area has something going on that's highly specialized. Okay, Eddie, hospital, medical for sure. Some police and protection, cattle, yeah, leather products, okay, good. Bakery, welder, gambling, yeah, <laughs> Liz, that would probably work there. Maybe some foods. Um, there can be all kinds of industries. Again, that's that agglomeration thing, like here in Ottawa, uh, Nate, you just put steel. Um, there's a lot of steel products on the north side of Ottawa. There's like four or five companies that specialize in different forms of uh, steel uh, production, uh, making things from steel. So um, with the agglomeration in a smaller industry, it might be something that's feeding the central business district, but it just happened to evolve outside of the city center. So we got all kinds of possibilities um, going on with that. All right, so. So how about employment in sub-centers? So give this, these two bullets a little read. So tacit information, I highlighted that term. Go ahead on the chat box and a couple of you at least uh, have had me before. This is kind of a weird word that most people don't know what it means, but what does it mean to have tacit information? And don't Google it and cut and paste it. Just kind of put it into your own words. If you don't know it, that's, what we're, that's why we're doing this for. So FaceTime is required to exchange complex and tacit information. All right, yeah, good, Nate. Um, stuff that you kind of, you don't know where it came from. You kinda, it's kind of hard to describe. Um, it can be kind of a gut feeling that you have from the environment. It might be a lot of a accumulation of knowledge and history that you have. Um, and so uh, it kind of ties together a, a bunch of information that's contained in your brain. And sometimes the face-to-face -face interaction is kind of our highest level of communication that allows more of that type of information. So Friedrich Hayek was big on 
the amount of information, the mundane information that most people don't give a darn about, but you hold a lot of that tacit information. All right, so give this a read. So we've seen this throughout history. Now th this data goes back a lot further, right? So 88% in 1880 versus 24% in 1963. So apparently cities do reach kind of a critical mass where they have to stop. I think a lot of that might be that it's easier to build somewhere else rather than to maybe tear down the four-story building that's there and build a a uh, 50 story skyscraper but that could also be in part due to the leadership of the of the of the city as well also a lot bigger population a lot bigger population yeah definitely so the decentralization of the population um, increases in income we all kind of like space right so as we become and i shouldn't say we all like that that's not a fair statement but in general um humans tend to prefer a little more space as, a rev, as opposed to being kind of tight. Um, and so as we can afford uh, a longer commute or gas or car or other things that come across from or that come about from living further out, you get more space, but you have um, more expenses, but increases in income can help offset that. So it's, it's, it's a natural um, phenomenon from, from that growth. Okay, so some of our future chapters, we'll get more into this crime and education. Um, you know, I think the coronavirus, of course, has highlighted um, some of the problems we have with larger densities, right? So, you know, Italy was the first to suffer and who's suffering the most right now in the United States? If you guys want to check out, or if you're unmuted, that's fine. Yeah, New York City, right? So the place with the highest densities are the ones that are, are hurting. And so, you know, will that play into people's decisions in the future of whether they want to live in a highly dense area? I don't know. You know, I, I think this is a big enough shock to the system that it could change some cultural norms for us um, because then we're all going to start to question, well, what's the next virus around the corner um, that might hit us? And so places in rural Kansas, they're basically not too worried about Corona at this point, right? I mean, they still have to follow some orders, but they're not under the the stay in your house orders that even in little old Ottawa we're in because we're in fairly close proximity to Lawrence and downtown of Kansas City. So these are all factors that people are going to take into account on where they want to live. All right, so how do we grow? We can grow up or we can grow out. So here's our sprawl question. So what causes urban sprawl? Um, what do you think is a cultural dimension? That last question there, cultural dimension to urban density and sprawl. Maybe on the chat box, why don't you all think about that question and throw out some answers to, you know, what is it about us Americans anyway? Uh, we'll just speak as a, uh, uh, the United States, although um, JC and Samir, I don't know if you guys have that phenomenon in your uh, countries. Um, so feel free to uh, add in things from your neck of the woods. In fact, that'd be more interesting to hear what you think about uh, cities moving out. When I visited JC's home country, um, Johannesburg is a pretty dense central city and there seem to be lots of people living on the outskirts. And uh, is there that same preference that we seem to have in the in the United States that more space is preferred or is it just because it's cheaper?
Well, that's an interesting one, Nate. Separation of business and home, like kind of uh, maybe somewhat culturally wanting to compartmentalize. Uh, the reason I think it's interesting is because we're not doing that now. Like I'm in my house right now teaching class. I, I do tend to think that this Corona deal is going to open new doors um, to how we can deliver education and, you know, that it doesn't always have to look, walk, and talk. Not so much for me because I've been doing this type of thing. Well, I'm, I'm learning a lot, by the way, as you guys probably know, uh, teaching these classes. But some of my other colleagues are still very much pen and paper, and they, they've been um, going leaps and bounds. And uh, I think they'll find that their life can be easier um, once they embrace some of these new technologies and how we can reach, uh, reach other people. So. Okay, close to opportunities. Yeah. Um, you know, do we have uh, kind of a white picket fence mentality, the suburban, is that the good life in the United States? I don't know. That, that's a cultural question. If, if that's what we grow up with when we're little, and I assume part of that is determined by if you grew up in a metropolitan area or grew up somewhere else. All right, let me pause 10 seconds to see if anybody wants to verbalize what you wrote or some other things that came to mind at this point. All right. Let's move on here. So, um, we have some policy issues um, that come about when we look at sprawl. You know, is it, does, should we just let the free market kind of figure out uh, what we should do and how? So the one I wanted to focus on first anyway is this underpricing of fringe infrastructure. What do you think that means? What does that mean to you, fringe infrastructure? Maybe we can start by uh, you guys in the chat box telling me what you think infrastructure is, first of all, in a city. What, what is infrastructure to you? Give me some examples of infrastructure. Okay, good, Liz, highways. Roads, building highways. Subways, Dakota, good, yeah. So some sort of transfer, you guys got a lot of stuff on transportation. All right. Public stuff, yeah, Nate, expand on public stuff because I think that's part of what you want to go through. Parks, police, absolutely on police. What um, I was just like, anything that like the government or like the, uh, the people, I guess, kind of control. And it's not like a, a private thing, like a private business or anything like that, but like just like uh, infrastructure is like uh, what everybody kind of controls. And yeah. Yeah, so all of that stuff costs money. And so um, this was a little bit of an eye opener when I was a real estate developer. We were developing some land that was on the outskirts and I learned how it's an issue that there's response times that cities want to have for emergency services, like for fire trucks and for ambulances, that if you call 911, they would like to ideally, they keep track of how quickly the vehicle could come out to you. And so if you're proposing a new development out in the uh, sticks a little bit outside that boundary, then sometimes by law or otherwise, they're forced to build a new fire department, a new place that has fire trucks and possibly a new uh, ambulance, uh, a place where ambulances could be uh, for emergency response. And one of the other issues we had was on um, if houses had to be outfitted with sprinkler systems because they were on the outskirts of a rural development. So it's a bigger problem than most people would give credit for. They just kind of think, we, as Americans especially anyway, we start to take for granted uh, the conveniences that we have um, with things in the city. And, and so that stuff does take real money. It takes real tax dollars. 
ultimately that type of thing is going to be funded by your property tax dollars. And uh, that might not be the best thing for the city, even if it looks like that's where the public wants to go. So some consequences here from this study. Um, we've got 58% of land. Um, compared to a central city, a suburban household requires 58% more land, consumes the same amount of energy in housing. So we can think about uh, the farmland that's lost, um, the mass transit, if you have a busing system for maybe it's low income otherwise, you know, to have that go out uh, to provide transportation since some of you had like subways and buses, so other public transportation, um, all of that could be on the table as an issue. So here's uh, some density information. Uh, in two different places, Atlanta versus Barcelona. So we've got uh, Claudio represented here. Barcelona, Spain is the lighter gray. So the average density, 171 versus six in terms of people per hectare again, so roughly think of acre, and maximum distance uh, from the, from the uh, places where they're at so you can see the density is a lot different in different places. Okay, um, I think that pretty much wraps us up. We're just about out of time. Yeah, that was the last slide anyway. So uh, that's a wrap here, people. Nice work. Good job this week on doing our, our uh, experimental new way of doing things. So, um, for chapter 12, there is uh, some, just the review, or not chapter 12. Chapter 12 is the one we skipped. We just did chapter 13. Um, so there's some fairly easy problems for you to work through uh, for next time. It's just review the concepts and there's literally just uh, three. So I kind of want you to, your homework is to read the chapter and have those problems. It's literally one, three, and five, and they're just the review ones. So that is your homework uh, for Monday that you can do.